Yeah, I, I'm Jackson. I have zero experience with carpentry. I studied at a school for historic preservation in Boston and learned about how things were built, you know, 250 years ago. There's a long way to go. I'm nowhere near the top. Not that I thought I was, but there's so much more to do out there. Welcome back to the Passion for Craft podcast. Uh, we are here with Daniel Parrish. Um, would you like to share a little bit about yourself and what you do, where you're from? Sure. Well, I'm Dan Parrish. I'm from Los Angeles. I own a finished carpentry and architectural millwork company called Millworks by Design. And uh, that company's about 15 years old now. About the same age as my second daughter. <laughs> <laughs> about the same stage developmentally. <laughs> Step moody at times, yeah. but uh, overall really fun. Kind of gangly, <laughs> kind of yeah, awkward, <laughs> but starting to come into her own, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great analogy, great way of putting it. Mm -hmm. so, it's amazing how accurate it's been through the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Budding child, learning to yeah. walk, and then, yeah. All those things. The uh, I wanted to have Dan on because I've uh, known him a long time, and uh, he was reminding me he was here 10-ish years ago in this building, which is now our offices, but we were manufacturing out of that out of the time. Um, but he has a really uh, unique way of you know managing craft right in the field and uh, we, we can talk about that but but uh i'm not sure there's many other people that are doing what you're doing B built a big team I mean, how many guys are working for you we have about 70 carpenters in the field right now <laughs> oh my gosh wow and um to total head counts about nine 97 just under so i mean right a really That's special crazy. unique you know uh <laughs> piece in the market right and so um we just want to talk about that. We, you know, the point of this podcast is to help people, you know, get better and and practice their craft. And one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about too is the training. You used to send your guys to the ICAA, the Institute of Classical mm -hmm. Architecture and Art, you know, training sessions where they'd learn about design. I know I came and gave some talks, and your guys would show up. And so, how did you get started? Like, how did you? Because okay. because you know, I both know Gary Katz. I think yeah. that's how we met. Yeah, and we so did meet through Gary. And yeah. so, uh, you know, you were doing stairs, right, with him? So, yeah. Well, the way I got started was going way back. Actually, is my dad is an architect. Mm. He's a commercial architect. Wow. And so um, I grew up with him working on schools and airports, projects like that. And uh, I also grew up really entrepreneurial. My family is very entrepreneurial. And dad talked for years. I mean, I can remember him as a kid talking about how a career in the trades would be a great opportunity because of the decline that he was observing. That's fascinating. No way. And this is like... That 30 is... years, 40 years ago now, almost wow. 35 wow. years ago. Yeah. A visionary. So he was like, there's going to be a hole. He's, and he you was saying there's going to be a hole. Yeah. And That's also cool. I was a little bit lucky also that my parents were not pushing college. So I never had the, the familial pressure to get a degree or to go to college. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it wasn't ever like preventing us from going to college. One of my brothers is a doctorate, has a doctorate in philosophy. That's a lot but of college. It was much more like, hey, there's this opportunity. If, if, if it feels right for you, then don't waste your time going to college. Like go apprentice as early as possible. Wow. Start working right away. So that's kind of how I, that's the flavor that I grew up with, uh, which I didn't realize until later that a lot of other, a lot of people has, have experienced a whole other thing, you know, pressures, right. sometimes feeling like a failure for going into the trades. Right. You know, so when I, I moved to LA right out of high school and I had my heart set on being a framer. I wanted to, I especially, I wanted to stack roofs. What, why, you know? what was the, I just, I had had a little bit of exposure to it Yeah. and I wanted the challenge of, of cutting roofs. It was a romantic notion for me as well. I, yeah. I wanted to be a framer for a while. And, you know, and then, and maybe post and beam, you know, like I was kind of into that, that. Yeah. And so I got hired by this company that I thought was a framing company. Like they had, they actually presented themselves as a framer to hmm. me, but I didn't find out till later that they were actually a temp labor company. <laughs> <laughs> and the first job they sent me to was with this guy to hang an entry door 
And that guy happened to be Gary Katz. Oh Whoa, oh, no way. Because I showed up with my <laughs> skill saw, you know, and my, my framing hammer. Oh, my gosh. And I'm hanging a front door. Like, this is stupid. <laughs> and um, But I did my job. And Gary called me back the next day, called the company back because he, yeah. he was like, you know, rent a laborer, basically. <laughs> and the next day, we sh- uh, it was the first day of a massive Victorian exterior trim job. Cool. You probably have seen pictures of that mm-hmm. house. I have. And within a month or two, I was hooked. Yeah. You know, on the finished carpentry trade. Yeah. I just lucked out so much because that house had so many different kinds of of trim and details and things that I within the first year I I, I kind of had a taste of almost everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, crown, casing, balustrades, columns, paneling. What an education. Wow. He had a whole crown. bouquet of... Just, yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And so I kind of haven't looked back in terms of the trade that I'm in from that point. And so... How long were you on that job? At, at least a year. Oh, okay, long time. At least a year, because we did the whole exterior and then we moved to the interior. And then from there, we did several other custom houses together when I was on Gary's crew. Was that as a two-man team or job? No, more guys no, we had more than... I was like, it was probably God. four or five, maybe six guys. Still a small crew. That's, was his yeah, brother cool. with him at the time? It was actually his brother's company. Okay. And Gary was working there. It was Cat's Interiors. I still remember hearing that 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 it was a two hundred thousand dollar job, and I thought, "Oh my God, these guys <laughs> must be rich. <laughs> the bosses must be rich." <laughs> so that's that's where I started, and that so Gary and I clicked right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I was I had a work ethic, and I wanted to learn, and um, I was learning quickly. I had a I had a mind for geometry. And so Gary saw a guy that, you know, wanted to learn and he, that was right when he was, I think he had just published his first book when I met him and he was just getting into doing live shows for JLC at the time. I think that's when he was just starting. You're 22 at the time? I was 17 or 18, 17. Yeah. Dude. So you were fresh out of high school and went right in. Yeah. That's awesome. That is awesome. Uh, it wasn't my first job when I got to LA. It was it was like my second because I actually got fired from my first one. <laughs> <laughs> you skipped over that story. There's which that was, hard work ethic, right? Which was testing software for Kinkos. Oh my gosh! And I got fired because I fell asleep at my desk. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm using a computer all the time. Yeah, uh, that's um, hilarious. Yeah. So, anyways, um, long story short, I I worked with Gary in the field side by side for maybe about two or three years, something like that. And then he started to get busier and busier with his writing and with his educational stuff. And and I think it was my fourth year with Gary that, that we ended up, he ended up leaving the company and I went with him and we started traveling around and doing road, both road shows and clinics, JLC live clinics together. And I, I helped him shoot some videos and, do photography for some of his articles and there was there was a good year year and a half where that's pretty much all we were doing Mm -hmm. and that was a whole new experience too like doing carpentry live in front of a whole bunch of people watching and i always appreciated how well gary could recover from you know pulling some boneheaded mistake yeah bad cut you're in front of a hundred (laughs) people with a chop saw you know (laughs) but he but he was able to do that and recover from it and and do it in a way that just made people relate to him even more. Yeah. You know. That's cool. He's a great teacher. <clears throat> so you you're with him for a while, then you he go starts doing that, so you go out on your own? Well, I wanted to I wanted to learn how to build stairs. Hmm. And uh he was probably I think he was getting tired of me too cuz I was young and cocky and kind of arrogant, always arguing with him about stuff. So it was kind of time to part ways. And and he introduced me to a guy named Jed Dixon in Rhode Island. Oh, Jed. And I spent, I think it was about six months at Jed's house uh, working for free, room and board. Nice. I stayed at his farm in, have you been to his farm in Rhode uh, Island? No, I haven't. So he has this, you know, 
he lives in a house that's like 300 years old. Yeah, I knew that. He's got a stone shop outside that's heated by wood. And it's just him and one other guy. And they're doing... The reason I wanted to work with him is because he knows how to do tangent hand railing, which is an old, old uh, stop method of doing railing, laying out and making wreathed railing parts. What does that mean, wreathed railing parts? Sorry, apprentice. Well, that means if, if you can, can you think of a, so he was working in Boston mm -hmm. and a lot of, there's a lot of brownstone homes in Boston that yeah. are four or five stories. And a lot of them have these elliptical staircases. Continuous rail. Continuous too. rail railings that go up four or five stories. Yeah. So when you have an elliptical stair and you have this continuous railing going up, when it gets to that narrow part of the ellipse right that you have to hand make the parts oh that, wow that go around that that turn yeah it's not only a turn but it's also rising mm -hmm. and so it's kind of a complex geometric shape that there is a method for laying it out in a solid block of wood and carving it out no way so those are carved out like but, hand hand carved out well roughed out with a bandsaw mm -hmm. you know but then carved by hand yeah that's, that's sweet so we did so the the big radius would we would usually glue up as, mm -hmm. uh, but we would make our own uh parts mm -hmm. you know laminations out of s solid mahogany and then we would make the wreathed parts wow and, as well as all the balusters yeah. and um and what do you posts. call that part the wreathed a wreath yeah. How do you spell that? W R E A T H. E A T H. It's like on your door at Christmas. A wreathed uh, handrail part. Yeah. Interesting. I've never heard that term. And it's a part that you cannot buy. I mean, it has right. to be made. Mm -hmm. um, and this is what I wanted to do because I wanted to. I wanted to. Like stair building is kind of like the pinnacle of right. carpentry. It is. You know. So, um, and it wasn't just handrail. We were also building stringers like housed stringers um and skirt board with the swooping uh rises and, and the moldings on top of, those, of it yeah. you just did one of those yeah. yeah it was just we were just building that stuff all day all the time did you ever like have any experience in the lower end production home stuff or you kind of it seemed mm -hmm. like in that victorian you talked about that's <laughs> kind of like pretty high end already not really I mean, I, we did some condos and we did some mm -hmm. lower end houses like in Ventura and Gary is really big on, um, production techniques. Mm -hmm. So we, so I really learned a lot about that from him. Um, he learned how to hang doors, like sight hang doors from a, from a pair of brothers, Al and Royal Schaefer. Yeah. He told us about them. And, uh, and I met both of those guys. And I learned how to hang doors from Gary. And so I always learned, I, I, that's how I hung doors, is that production style. And it wasn't until way later that we started doing shop fit doors. So, and, and shop fit is a custom made door, right? Yeah. That you made specifically for a... I don't like to call them pre-hung because that sort of brings something else to mind. Right, right. <laughs> but it's pre-hung. Yeah, you know? okay, great. Hung in a shop. Yeah, Fit yeah. in a shop, mortised in a shop, you know. Awesome. We never used to do that in Southern California. It was all, it, it was considered high end actually to sight hang doors, scribe hang doors like huh. Royal. Ro, like it was considered Royal high Shepherd end did. to do that. It was, yeah. How interesting. It's, it's starting to change now. But I remember Gary going out to his place and seeing him hang doors. I was like, why are you doing this? Like With the door bench yeah, and everything. Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was, he said it's kind of that market kind of calls for that. So, yeah. Interesting. Oh, that's yeah. that bench with like the carpet wrapped around it. Is yeah. That, okay. I it see was it was kind of a weird hybrid between production style carpentry and high end carpentry. Mm -hmm. And basically, what they do is they would buy book doors. The builder would usually buy book doors, and the finished carpenter would go through and set the jams. And a lot of times, they'd use lower end guys to set the jams, so the jams are not perfect. Right. And then we would scribe hang all the doors. I mean, scribe hanging is what. Meaning, however the jam was sitting, it could be plum, it could not be plum, it could be bowed, whatever. You're just putting We're it in. We're scribe hanging that door leaf to exactly the shape of that jam. 
That's crazy. So that it's exactly a perfect 330 seconds uh-huh. reveal, no matter what's going on with that jam. <laughs> no matter if they jacked it up or not. And, and that using was- that method, like we could do, we could do inch and three quarter, eight foot doors. We could do like 25 a day. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Yeah. Are you using uh, round using- edge uh, hinges or square? Either. If it's a square edge, we had a we had a corner chisel. You did that would knock out the corner. Mm. Yeah, that's wild. Um, the uh, so that is crazy. <laughs> that's really fun. So after the stairs, what did you do? So after the stairs, so while I was while I was in Rhode Island, prior to that, I'd kind of been a little bit of a knucklehead and was sowing some wild oats. And while I was there, I did a lot of thinking about my life and decided that I wanted to propose to the girl I was seeing back in LA. And so when I came home, that's what I did. And nice. she said, yes. And we got married. We're still married. Mazel. Um, five kids. Nice. And um, I can relate to that one. Yeah. <laughs> I got house full. Well. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, and so that's what brought me back to LA. Nice. And that's why I'm still in LA. Although now, like we could move if we wanted to, but mm-hmm. we love it. We like it. The weather, it's nice. So when I went back to LA, I, I, I looked for a company that was doing stairs because cool. I wanted to continue to build stairs. And so I went to work for a, a group out there who was building stairs. And I worked for them for about three years mm-hmm. or two years before I started um, Millworks by Design. And what was the, you know, desire or impetus you wanted to own your own business or you saw a hole in the market or from day one i wanted to own my own business yeah yeah that was always what i was working for um and actually when i when i started when i went back to work for that la company that stair company i actually didn't end up building that many stairs I, i did do some but i ended up starting a finished carpentry division within that company right and so Really quickly, I started managing people, bidding jobs, um, you know, like getting into that management side. Yeah. And um, and they wanted me to stay and continue to work for them. Mm-hmm. But it just, it wasn't going to work out long term. Right. And I had an opportunity. I had a partner that I started Millworks by Design with. And um, Are you so guys just, still partners? Uh, yes, we are. But I'm in the process of buying them out well speak to that really quick that because it sounds like you went into the game because you just had a love of uh like craft and working with your hands and everything and then it seems like when you joined in in la um with i don't remember the name of that company but when you joined in with them you kind of quickly got put into a managerial role so that yeah. transition was that a hard transition for you to make or were you kind of ready Not really for me yeah um i had I sort of always had been that guy that like saw the leadership vacuum yeah, and either because I was ignorant or because I was cocky would step into it. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of that cockiness has been slapped out of me over the years. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Been eating some humble pie. There's definitely some of that at the beginning. Um, So I've always been pretty comfortable in that role. Mm -hmm. And... um, and so it came pretty naturally. Nice. And I was pushing hard as a you know as a young man. I was pushing really really hard, um, and really wanted to start my own thing. And so I was just you know I was working really hard. That's awesome. So and Miller by Design is is an install company, right? We started out as a finished carpentry company. Okay. Trim carpentry. So what's the difference between those two? What I think the difference is well at least. You, the language in our yeah. part of the industry is that an installer is someone who subcontracts themselves out to other mill workers, uh, manufacturers, mm-hmm. millwork manufacturers to install their product. Mm-hmm. Trim carpenters are guys who are hanging doors on site, running moldings, and building stuff on site, building paneled rooms, building ceilings, building beams, mm-hmm. you know, making stuff on site. Mm-hmm. And that's how we started is by is trim carpentry, mm-hmm. finished carpentry. And we didn't get into install until a couple years later, just kind of 
by chance, we were approached by a company that was looking for an installer and we went for it. So we, our first job was this huge job. Um, it was like eight mil, eight semi trucks full of millwork <laughs> what? and all pre-finished. It was our first time we'd ever done anything pre-finished. <laughs> and how many guys did you It have? was like, oh. <laughs> Um, we probably had 30 or 40 guys on the team at that, oh, point, nice. at that point. Oh, nice. So you could okay, handle it. Okay, so you were in so good, we could handle good hands. It. Yeah. I mean, we only survived it because we knew about benchmarks and right. control lines and things like that. Well, I, th- you know? I thought you were going to say two or like three. No. Because that would have been a... <laughs> but it opened our eyes to a whole nother world. world. Yeah. Like we did not know that millwork was being done that way mm-hmm. up until that point. Or at least not in the residential space, it, it just opened our eyes. You know, it was yeah. just like, whoa, this is, this is something, this is completely different. Would you mind speaking a little bit to, I mean, your dad was a commercial architect. Yeah. And you went into the residential side, it seems like, pretty quickly. What, was there any desire to go into the commercial side? Because no. it seems like the stuff you Not wanted to do there's wasn't nothing, like There's it. nothing good to do in the commercial <laughs> side. Well, I, we have done some commercial stuff. That He's done some good we commercial. like, <laughs> but we don't want to do schools or airports. Well, this is a, there's an interesting thing where we've just been talking about the, the state of craft in America and feel like it's, it's on the decline or maybe yeah. it's not on the decline, but it's down right now. Like the, it currently is not in a good place. And you know, these guys are residential uh, builders, you're a residential builder. Primarily, yeah. Primarily. And I would think that there there's a lot more impact if you go to a museum that is built in a classical way to see like coffered ceilings and beautiful yeah. wainscot, like, whoa, like that there, there's really a museum. There's a museum in LA, the Getty. Yeah. That has a whole bunch of historical rooms in it. Yeah. I would have loved to build that. Uh-huh. Um, we've done, we've done some country club work. Yeah. That, that is really nice. Like it's like doing everything residential, but on a larger scale. Right. We've done some, uh, we just, fi- we finished a project for the Wilshire Boulevard temple. Oh, cool. The Jewish temple in LA. Mm-hmm. So there are some commercial clients out there that want craftsmanship. Yeah. But there's a lot of compromise in, in the commercial space. So I'm have, sure. So we have to be super careful. Cause about it's a bottom line going. thing at the end yeah. of the day. Well, we, yeah. we do uh, our work that's commercial is historic. And you've mentioned a couple of stories there. There's craft there, right? And yeah. So, but yeah, there's not a ton. Yeah. So, um, a guy comes to work for you. Yeah. Um, what, what kind of training do you put him through? What kind of, what kind of, do you have a test that he has to take? Does there, yeah. is there, you know, three levels of guys on your on your teams. I mean, how does it work? Well, you're catching me at a at a time where we're a, we're about to make some big improvements. So I'd love to talk about what we're what we've been doing, but also what we're yeah, for going sure. to do. Love that to sounds hear. awesome. Because um, the scale is allowing us to do some things that we may not we wouldn't have been able to do when we were really small, mm-hmm. but. What, what we have been doing is when a guy, when a guy comes to apply uh, to us, with us, they, we have a test, a written test that they have to take. Mm-hmm. It's like a 12-page thing. And part of it is them answering questions that sort of clue us in on what their, what their level of knowledge is. And the other part of it is them ranking themselves on a list of tasks. Hmm. And the scale is basically, I've never done this, or I can do it, but with help, or I can do this completely unsupervised, hmm. um, you know, and we let them rank themselves. I'd yeah. love to see that test. Do <laughs> <laughs> you love to take it? Yeah. And, take it past? Well, I'd like to take it. I'd like to look at it. It's, it's, it's uh, I've often thought that that, the industry needs a test so that people know where they stand, know where they rank. A lot of yeah. guys are doing a lot of carpentry, but they're like, I don't know where I am in this world. And so, you know, it's it's hard, right? If it you're is, yeah. if you're out there just hanging doors or running trim every day, but you've been doing it for 10 years, well, how good really am I? Right. And what's and so, that guy worth? Yeah, what's that guy worth? Mm. So, so we so what we've done is we've we have put uh we've we've tiered out a pay scale. 
So we have Carpenter level one, which is like entry level Carpenter, all the way up to Carpenter 10. Wow. And each one of those, um, each one of those ranks has a pay band mm -hmm. that's associated with it. And we're still, this is a, this is a project that's being done over time. It's not perfect yeah. yet. Right. But, but we have skills that are associated with each one of those ranks and also tools that are associated with those skills. So you got to be able to demonstrate that you know how to use this tool, be able to do this skill yeah. and be verified by our management team that you mm -hmm. can do it. And so, so we basically go on trust at first. Like sure. the guy says, this is what he can do. He says, this is, and, and that based on his answers, that slots him out into what, what rank you might be in. Mm -hmm. And we also have our foreman interview the new guys yeah and based and that that interview will also help rank them out it's a trust but verify system right and then after that we if, it, if it's a new guy like a lower level guy we will intentionally pair them up with a senior level guy nice so that he has somebody that he's with for a period of time that can show him the ropes mm -hmm. and not only just with the craft itself but also with our our team, our company culture, mm -hmm. like the culture of our team on site, how we do it, how we show up. Right. Cause we don't just throw guys and tools at jobs. We show up in a certain way. We have equipment that's all painted the same color. We have, we have ways that we want our shop areas on the job site to look. So they need yeah. to learn all that and they need to learn it from somebody who's been around for a while. That's then, super slick, by the way. And then uh, we have a twice a year, we call it our Carpenter's Comp Review. So twice a year in February and in August, we pull our foreman team in mm -hmm. and we go through every guy on the crew. Wow. And we, and we talk about what they've learned, what they've been working on. We may make decisions like taking one of the younger guys and moving him to a different guy because... On our jobs, a guy could get stuck doing the same task for a year, mm -hmm. you know? So we try to move people around so that they have more, more exposure to different yeah. things. And, and, it's in, and it's based on the feedback that we're getting. We have several different like structured discussions that we lead the foreman team through about every single guy on the staff. And based on the data that's coming out of that meeting and other sources, we're making decisions about who is being promoted through the ranks cool. twice a year. Can you ever scale? Can you ever fall back? Yeah, you can. How, did, how does that process look like? Cause you I, can oversell yourself nice. and not be able to, to, to deliver. Yep. So if that's the case, we have, we've definitely had situations where we've had to say, Hey, you know, we, you're being paid as an eight, mm -hmm. but you are not comparable to all the other eights. Yeah. And it's not fair for you to be in this pay band if you cannot show up with the same skills or the same productivity mm -hmm. as all the other eights. Yeah. So it's a fairness thing too. Yeah. yeah. It makes a lot of sense too. What does a like a one look like and say an eight? Like just in like would in, I be able in, to come yeah. on your job site as a one? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Because a one is mostly about attitude. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know, if you have a great attitude and you want to work, yeah. you're ready to learn. We'll take somebody who has no experience. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a little, but this is your guy. Then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, LA. so one is like uh, can sweep the floor. Sweet. You know, can um, has the most basic of tools. Mm -hmm. You know, and might be humping material sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you know, like it's basic, basic for sure. And then an eight. An eight is a guy who can do almost everything. Mm -hmm. Like an eight should be able to do um, like hang crown molding, but cut multiple pieces off of a cut list and have most of them fit. Mm -hmm. You know, not like take 15 minutes to fit one piece and then, right. you know, climb up and down the, you know, like yeah. has to demonstrate <laughs> some, some production technique. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, an eight will, will, should be able to do casing, base, crown, multi-piece, moldings um hang jams doors are like high eights and nines for us swinging mm -hmm. doors and there's a whole bunch of stuff in the door category 
So most of our eights have some experience with doors, are also getting experience with um, installing cabinetry, like scribe fitting cabinetry. Mm -hmm. um, our eights are are pretty solid. Mm -hmm. And then the yeah, tens? They, they would be considered a journeyman. Okay, and then like the 10 is probably the stairs and stuff? Tens are our masters, mm -hmm. yeah. And the thing is, is there's kind of, there's three different veins. You know, there's trim carpentry, there's cabinetry, and there's stair building for us, and door hanging. So really, so someone could be a four. ten in cabinetry, but like a seven in oh, stairs. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then so, you wouldn't assign. You would probably keep the tens in their lane, as like a master stair builder to more or less. Yeah, guys. I mean, yeah. we we also want to move them around, and right. we want our tens to to demonstrate that they are continuing to learn. Mm. So I love that, you know, so we'll try to place them based on where they can learn as well. Cool. That's so methodical. That's awesome. So are you an apprentice one through three and then a journeyman, you know, it's four probably more seven? like one through five. I would say, yeah, apprentice is more like one through five. Okay. And a journeyman would be like six through nine. Mm -hmm. And then our tens, you know, we, we even call them sometimes master carpenters. Mm hmm. Yeah, and so you're, the the size projects that you're working on, the size things that they're huge houses, probably truckloads of millwork. So um, yeah, yeah, and then you'll be on them a year, right? Sometimes more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Our biggest job right now. So first of all, it's not all about size of the job, sure, because we'll also do small jobs and be really happy about doing them. Yeah, because the big jobs can eat your lunch for sure. How and, do you mean by that? Well. Like our biggest job right now, the the budget is about 32,000 man hours for the field. Wow. And what can happen is if you mess something up, either through estimating it incorrectly mm -hmm. or by managing it incorrectly, your mistake can be like 10% yeah, is 3,200 hours. I mean, it's just yeah. like the yeah. cost of That's more than a year for one guy. Higher. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah. So if you screw it up, it can bite you real hard. Yeah. I think one guy for years, 2000 hours, basically. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> yeah, a guy and a half or a year's the wage is, is, is gone. So and can, so, I, can so, I tell you yeah, what we're yeah, doing so, next? But I was about to say, yeah. We, is? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because for us, this is still a little bit loose. Mm -hmm. Like we, we need to tighten up um, the, the, the skills to rank association. It needs to be really tight mm -hmm. and it needs to be physical. Like, what do you mean by that? Ooh, like, yeah. in order to prove that you are an eight carpenter, mm -hmm. you need to be able to pass a skills test. Oh, yeah. Okay. Like you need to actually cut the crown, you know, demonstrate that you've achieved that. Yeah. Kind of like in like in martial arts, yeah. where you where <laughs> you graduate awesome. through you do your, uh, belt colors. Yeah. That we have a vision for something more tangible mm -hmm. like that. And so... Um, actually, this year, we're planning on starting what we're calling MBD University. Cool. And the purpose of this, this will basically, this will look like a place in our shop that is set up where guys can come in and work. That's not the job site. And it has kind of a four-pronged purpose. And the purpose of this is to use it kind of like a research and development lab Mm -hmm. So when we have something that we want to try out or we have a job coming up that has a certain task that we're not really that familiar with, yeah. um, or we want to figure out what the best, pra the best way to do something is, mm -hmm. we can use this space to do that. We can hang doors, all the different ways that there is to hang doors and figure out objectively which one is the best, mm -hmm. which one is the fastest, highest quality, all those things. That's awesome. And um, so that's one purpose. Another purpose is to um, do skills tests for new hires. So you come in, day one is do this, do this task. Now do this one, now do that one to prove that, or, or, or to show us where you're at, mm -hmm. you know, in your, in your journey as a carpenter. So you can observe them versus just reading their paper. You yep. can get a better feel for exactly. their level. Exactly. And so you can start a stopwatch and go, well, you got five of these done in one day. Exactly. You're probably at a two or you're at mm -hmm. a... Yep. And then the third one is to train our own people. 
Mm-hmm. So to have a space where apprentices can come in or journeymen or masters and have it not be the job site where you're working on an actual task where it's a commercial activity. Yeah. Where you can come in and you can do a you can do a thing over and over and over and over until you have it mastered. Mm-hmm. So um shimming, scribing, yeah, you know, doing casing, doing crown, whatever whatever it is. Um, we will have guys in there doing that. And then the fourth thing is uh, rank testing, promotion testing, where we have a guy who wants to promote from a seven to an eight. Mm -hmm. We will have a pre-described list of activities that they need to do with the standards. They come in, they do it. If they're successful, they get promoted. That's, oh, that's cool. awesome. I would want to go try that out. <laughs> yeah. Just you're, to see where I stand. Yeah, I mean, that. you're really setting up another little mini guild, right? It's, yeah, let's, yeah. yeah, yeah because you it are is. testing to rise to the next level. You are showing your peers what you can do. It's, it's, and we have dude, to do it because we don't, slick. it's not out there. Yeah. yeah. You know, it doesn't there is exist nothing, anywhere. There, the union kind of does it, but. Right it's not the same and it's not as like relevant to the trade that, that we're in. Right. How uh, unique are you? And yeah, I don't want you to brag. I mean, but, but literally, I mean, I don't know of anybody else doing that. I've never heard of it. Right. And that's one reason I wanted you on the show. I mean, just like you're doing something that I don't know of anybody else that's doing. And I'm sure there are guys that are right. I'm I'm sure. sure, Yeah. But, but I mean, you're really approaching it in a very professional, you know, old school way. That's, you know, special awesome yeah thank you are anybody uh, do you have competitors in you know in california that that are you know not that i know of yeah no we have competitors of course yeah um local to la and we know of other people in other states um i have a lot of relationships kind of through the states especially because of gary mm-hmm. um and i'm aware of one company on the east coast who may be doing something kind of like this um, but I'm, I don't know how far down the road they are or like exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, are you, uh, talk about the ICAA and whether you're still training your guys in that classical stuff, why you did yeah. that, you know, kind of what was the thinking then? Yeah. Well, I, so we started, um, we started supporting ICAA pretty much when we started the company, mostly just cause I was interested in classical architecture. Mm-hmm. And then we realized there's all these general contractors here and architects <laughs> and no other subcontractors. <laughs> so it turned out to be a great networking thing. Right. Yeah, um, that's smart. It's not that way anymore. You know, it's grown a lot since then. But, um, but yeah, we will, we have an open scholarship thing where when the ICAA publishes a class, they do, they do classes on cl- uh, classical molding and they do, um, classical orders right and any of those classes we have an open sponsorship for anybody in the company who wants to go so we're not requiring it yet yet but anybody who wants to go we pay for it what percentage of your guys are will go i mean is it 10 percent or is it like 80 probably there's probably 15 or 20 percent of our guys who have gone yeah mm-hmm. and and a number of our office people as well engineers estimators um, right now our estimating team is really, really, uh, into it. Sweet. And, um, but it's, it's honestly something that I'm may become a part of the MBD university because I think that, I think that for a craftsman to have like a, like a deep level of understanding and knowledge about how moldings are put together and, and how to use moldings. Mm-hmm. Like we can become such a much better resource for the design people that we work with. And, uh, it would kind of scratch an itch for me when I, you know, when I see how much, how much stuff out there is just like so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you're just getting, you're just nuts. Huh? Well, speaking of that, we, you know, one question we like to ask people is what do you think the state of craft is in America today? Uh, I know we kind of touched on it a little earlier, but I mean, where do you think it's at? Well, what's the context like of all of America or cause I'm kind of my, uh, my perspective is like we work in a very high end niche mm-hmm. in the market. So I'm thinking I'd all probably have a, a more positive view of it yes. based on our niche. But as a whole, it's, 
it's crap. <laughs> you mean you don't like the accent walls? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean I I I'm as a well so as a carpenter myself, like I can't walk into a building without looking at everything. Oh yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And almost everything you see is just pure crap. So what do we do about that? I mean, it sounds like that that um I mean, it feels like you are in a very real way solving a craft gap or, or whatever. I mean, and, and you're taking it upon yourself to send your guys to university. You're giving them a place to, to do it. How does he, how does a guy who doesn't have a, you know, hundred guys on his team and how I mean, does the I'm, go about I'm, changing craft? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm lucky because I just love it and I, you know, I'm passionate about it. And so I end up studying it and I went to North Bennett street and I did, you know, all that stuff. But, um, how do we raise the bar? You know, it's just, so this this is the part that's kind of frustrating for me working in the high end like our customers are you know the one percent or the or the the point one percent the point one percent mm -hmm. right and these are the people who for the most part care about craftsmanship and are paying for it yeah and it's very hard for us to be competitive on lower end projects mm -hmm. um however i do think that it's almost like a lot of the potential rests in the hands of guys who are doing like smaller, smaller companies, you know, smaller trim companies. If you're talking, if you're going to talk about carpentry specifically, uh, the way a lot of this is done across the United States is the carpenter has a lot of contact directly with designers and with homeowners mm -hmm. and the homeowners don't know what to do. Right. You know, and if the carpenter <laughs> could at just make some good choices about, what kind of baseboard he's putting in and what kind of casing and what kind of crown that would make a hell of a difference. Yeah. It's exactly what he told me when we met. Cause that's what you described is kind of me. Like I'm, I have a two man crew, me and my brother-in-law actually. And, uh, he's like, what's going on in your jobs? Like, I'm like, well, they usually just show me a picture and I try to make it, make it happen, you know, but they show you a picture and you have, you have opportunity there to inject knowledge. That was a game changer right? for me to kind of take the lead on it and be like, I'm the authority in this, not to be cocky or anything, but to use the knowledge that I have to suggest opportunities that are out there. Yeah. And, and they'll listen to you cause you're the expert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially if you start talking about why this is why I would choose this crown. Yeah. This is why I would choose this casing. But I don't think, and I don't think craftsmen are ready to, I had, I encouraged him to say, you are the leader on this job. You're, you're, and, and I don't think craftsmen are ready to, or think that they can carry that mantle yet. And, you know, they need encouragement. They need, you know, someone to tell them, no, 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 no one else knows, you know, you, you need to be the one that says, Hey, I want to do this because, yeah. and so. Well, that's why I'm just giddy about what you're doing with the standardization, because even just being able to say, you know, I'm a level seven carpenter and I can tell you that this is right and this is wrong. Because you're almost providing like a, a, a trust fault, like the, the hands to catch them to say like, you know what you know, go do it, go, go perform well, another, like you So know another it. angle on this is I'm convinced, this is one of the reasons why I'm so uh, excited about this, the whole training thing. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that, that we can do our work a lot more productively. Mm -hmm. Fewer man hours per unit. Yeah if we really got organized and figured out the best way to do it and like objectively tested it. Absolutely. And then got our entire team doing it consistently. So if you can lower the cost of it, mm -hmm. then maybe more people can afford it. Yeah. And like one, th one thing I'd love to do is I, I would really like to figure out how to build a development of, Dude, be so awesome. of like well-designed starter homes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And prove because every because the big thing is like well we can't afford to do that yeah mm -hmm. no I hate that it's, we've gotten that on shit, I don't know. it's BS it's I BS think that's just a story we're telling totally, ourselves yeah. totally it is so why can't we do, why can't we design and figure out how to build like entry level houses that are affordable mm -hmm. that are done really well yeah and I have a feeling that the new generation of home buyers like we will appreciate that yeah because I think there is a desire for quality. And there is a desire for craft and there is a desire for things that are made by hand or mm -hmm. made carefully, made with intention. Well, I think too, I think if your test and, and the testing that's going on and, you know, if, 
because I agree the union's the only one that's really training these days. And unless you go to a school like I did, um, you know, what if there was a, you know, certificate certification that happened that, you know, you could anywhere in the country know whether you're a one, two, three, four, eight, seven, whatever. Europe has it. Yeah, totally. They I, mean, do. I, was, I was just in Germany and they cannot believe the stuff that like what Americans are pulling off without it. <laughs> yeah. You know, they, yeah. They, but, they have a, they have a countrywide system mm-hmm. for, a, a, for training craftsmen. And their, their country shows it. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that there's you, still some nasty houses. Oh, really? <laughs> I guess just what I see on Google. The idealized version. Yeah. Well, the, the other fun thing about you doing this standardization process is, you know, it sounds like what the union's got is, is passable right now, but it, I mean, it seems like we have a real opportunity, uh, or you have a real opportunity to set a new standard, um, and to objectively set a new standard, not, not just, you know, we think this is the right way to do it, but no, no, no. Look at this. When guys install it this way, five times in a row versus when guys install it this way, five times in a row, these guys are done faster, done better and more accurately across the board and safely. And that's, safely, that's another yeah. major thing. Talking through is, OSHA. Yep. Doing things in a way that doesn't send people to the hospital. Yeah. Well, and that, that sets up an opportunity for you to, to really create that new standard and almost reinvent the guild system or bring revitalize the guild system. Um, and I'm sure there's a way you could set out a standardized test where people like him and him could pay for their guys to go, get certified by you and hmm. as funny as it sounds but i think it's a good idea um anyway the uh yeah i mean it's super cool because that would it, change it craft is. like if you had if you had to start standardized like just to be joe Schmo carpenter and you know you're a level three and you're like well i could be making more money across the board if i was just you know slightly better yeah to be clear with a guy like in order to get that raise, get that promotion, here's what you need to learn. Exactly what you need to learn. And here's the standard that you need to be able to demonstrate the skill in. Yeah. And here's a guy to help you learn yeah. it. You know? And here's eight other guys who have done it. So this is doable. Like you are and, able to do it. And here's two weeks of paid time where you're off of a job site That's and you're in a space and, and you can just go practice fail. it. Yeah. Go, you go can fail, fail a million times you can fail. and then get it right. Yep. Wow, that's real. I'm just, that's I'm exciting. excited. Yeah, that's but you really have you have fun. to build something like that into a budget. Yeah, you know, you, and what this means is we have to budget a certain amount of non-productive hours mm-hmm. per man, and everyone on the crew is going to be expected to participate in some way, mm-hmm. either be trained or do training, or be involved in like some of our masters or some of our journeymen. Mm-hmm. Those will be the guys who we say, all right, figure out the best way to shim a wall. Mm. Wow. Go. So you have cool. two weeks and any tool you want, figure it out. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's really cool. The, um, yeah, I know my head's going about six directions. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you broke him. Good. Um, yeah, Brent no, I, speechless. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, uh, it's why I wanted you to come on and wanted you to tell that story. I think it's, I think it's awesome. Um, really, excited what you're doing that's really awesome i'm excited to have because because i could never do this just by myself Mm -hmm. and it's taken 15 years really to get to the point where we have the people and the resources Mm -hmm. who can actually make something like this happen because we've already had one false start Mm. we have built out a space Mm -hmm. where we and we actually did start doing some physical tests for hiring people yeah and it was amazing how many people it eliminated from our hiring pool yeah I'm sure. Um, but w- I have to do it in a way that it, that it sustains, mm-hmm. you know? Because you, I hear an idea like this, and my first thought is make it happen, go fast, get it done. But the right way to do it is slow growth. Man, I've tried so many growth. things the fast way. Yeah. And I've had so many things fizzle out. Well, it's the same thing with any good, any good house. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. to do it proper love to hear more about your business and and yeah. you know um how you grew to gain that kind of audience you know was it you know serendipitous you know you know in hard work going into the ica and kind of getting in with the right crowd um 
you know, because sometimes the work you do will, will end up driving your level of competency. And so, yeah. you know, your challenge to do more, Richard, on, on our jobs, we are asking him to do more than he ever had to do on these other jobs. Crazy. So, yeah. so you probably feel like you're in a high growth period or like a learning curve. Big time. Yeah, I feel like because what I was doing before was kind of just production upgrades, like McMansion style new homeowner calls me hey I want to add you know beams to this you know room or whatever just wainscoting here you know nursery uh wainscot and um it was just I just hit a wall and I feel like the timing with meeting Brent was just perfect because it was like a like a reset button where I kind of figured all that stuff out and it was just getting bored. To he the was point. doing the same thing over and over. And I didn't know this world existed. I'm, I came in here to his class and it was just like my jaw just hit the floor looking at this stuff. And I'm like, I didn't even know this. Am I still on planet Earth? Yeah, there's you know? the same number of corners on that thing than there is in the whole house. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly. out, right? <laughs> so I'm just like, what? Like, yeah. this is out there? Yeah. And yeah, it is, it's inspiring. Like, it it is, gives you something to shoot for. It makes you feel like professional. Like, I kind of feel like doing those kind of jobs, although it was, you know, like we just had Gary on and he was talking about doing those apartments and getting like $6 a door and stuff. And uh, I was getting more than that per door, but um, <laughs> yeah, I feel like it was a good training ground though. Yeah. So just, cause as a carpenter, the competency is, to me, I've always thought, can you measure and cut and like visualize something? And if you got yeah. that, you're there. Mm-hmm. Everything else is just, and I um, feel like a lot of the high end guys could really use an education in the production side. Yeah, for sure. Because some of the stuff we see is just like, oh my gosh. Is it because As they're too slow or is it because they Take a piece of molding don't... up a ladder, you know, mark a pencil mark, take it back down, <laughs> go cut it, come back up, see if it fits. Nope, doesn't fit. Go back down. It's like. <laughs> Like there's better ways of doing it. Like, yeah. Twice cut ones. Yeah. Or have a cut man. Yeah. Like, hey, I'm gonna need fifteen and three eighths here. You so <laughs> uh, what do your job sites look like too? I mean, and the tools you're bringing on. Are you setting up a mini shop? I mean yeah. shapers, table saw? Sometimes. Yep. Okay. Interesting. We, standard kit is a large table saw, like a cabinet saw. Uh we use saw stops. Okay. And we built a cradle for them so we can fork them on and off trucks nice without it going nuts on us we we have a standard table that's on wheels that we can put a sheet of mdf on to have new tabletops whenever we need them so and they're they're set up so that they're just the right height to be an outfeed table so you can have we have multiple tables and then we have job boxes and um, supply cabinets and all of these things are painted the same color. So, cause a big part of our thing is like, when we show up, you know, we're here, it's professional. It, it is not like your normal trim crew experience, you sure. know? So, and our guys really like have gotten into that. You all run dust collection too? Yep. Yep. Nice. We run like, a, um, temp, you know, uh, s- small dust collection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then if we need a shaper, like a small shaper or a small uh, planer, you know, stuff like that, uh, it's not as common, but if we need it, we'll mm-hmm. set it up too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All these uh, materials. Shop saws, you know, on stands, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, these materials that you're having on site, they're materials that you guys are manufacturing? Yeah. Okay. Yep. We supply all of our own materials. Every once in a while, we're installing something that someone else supplies, but we don't like to do that. We, we like to... We like to have contracts where we supply and install. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then internally we decide what we're going to build on site. I think this is one thing that's different about us because a lot of, a lot of companies are either trim carpenters or they're millwork manufacturers. And those two ways of doing things are different. And, and honestly, there's good ways on both sides. Mm -hmm. So the way we're organized where where oftentimes we'll go into a project and we're supplying and installing all the doors, all the cabinetry, all the all the carpentry, all of everything, basically yeah. everything that's wood except for the wood floor. We get to pick and choose what stuff we're going to do carpentry style mm-hmm. or manufacturing style. Right. And so some stuff we are engineering and shop drawing and buying out 
and other stuff were buying raw material, you know, commodity material yeah. and making it. What is, what do they what is most of your work is with general contractors yeah. do be doing doing their stuff. And and so how do they perceive you? Do they is it is like those guys are great because it's a one stop shop and they give you the specs for the cabinets, the doors, the windows, whatever they're gonna say, and and you yeah. You know, absorb all that. The guys and- who embrace that kind of a package, they see us as able to span multiple trades. Like they can hire one guy who they would have to hire three or four. Well, we see on the commercial side uh, of restoration work, that's what they love about us. They love that we can restore windows and build new windows, right? They, they like that they can, you know, turn it all over to one person. And so right. now it's taken, you know, the long time to build that trust but because it's not normal right but um right so we have a so we have a couple of relationships where if they can they have us uh provide and install all the exterior doors and windows all the exterior trim all the interior trim all the cabinetry all the doors all the door hardware where we are both buying it out and installing it so are you warranting a door if it warps Yeah, and of course, we are buying also from manufacturers that have their own warranties as sure. well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so really, all the work that y'all would do if a door warps is you would just get it from the manufacturer that you got it from originally, and then just go reinstall it, it rehang it. Yeah, we're paying for a door right now. Yeah, that warped. Uh-huh. Uh huh. It should have been a thing that we just didn't warranty. Right. You know, so we do have to be careful about that. Mm-hmm. Some some stuff they want us to build is not warrantable. Mm-hmm. Right. This one we didn't strike the warranty and we're paying for it. <laughs> how much? How much of that stuff is classical uh, in design? Because you're in a kind of a modern market, right? Yeah, it's actually right now. It's probably about eighty percent really? classical that and twenty percent awesome. contemporary, which is really awesome. That's really fun. That's good to hear. It's been more. It's been going more and more towards traditional design. Are you working for like years. Appleton and Evans and all those yep, guys? Both those guys. Appleton, Evans, Ferguson, Shamamian. Yeah. We have two Ferguson jobs right now. Wow. And uh, they have an LA office. Others. No. Yeah. No, they have a they have an architect there that they use as their local hmm. executive architect. Nice. Yeah. But we're also doing some contemporary stuff too. Yeah. And um, that is harder in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A lot more demanding. Um, so I would never want to like let it go completely because I think we learn a lot of things on that work. But we just all, my whole team and I included, just have more fun doing classical work. Yeah, I'm sure, well, it's just I, more intricate. I, I feel like we're just scratching the surface, but um, yeah, this has been awesome. Yeah. Uh, what What is the name of your company? Just shout it out. Anything you would like to shout out? You've got the the whole the floor is yours. Uh, well, the name of the company is Millworks by Design. So if an apprentice out there is looking to go move to LA, apply for a job, Millworks by Design. We'll talk to him. Yeah, See you soon. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got to do a part two yeah. after lunch. We're at maybe. one hour already. Yeah, huh? exactly. Yeah. Flew Dan, by. Th- thanks for yeah, coming thank in. Thank you for coming on. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome. You're doing great work out there. Thank you. Really it's proud inspiring. of what you're doing. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. <laughs>